I want to think about um, what to do when we blow it, what to do when we mess up uh, and we fail and we make mistakes. Because uh, even as Christians, we're, we're prone to sin uh, and we can mess up. Maybe we promised something and we didn't keep it. Maybe we said to do something, we failed. Maybe we did something worse. Maybe we've hurt people or we've did things we're not proud of. We've looked at stuff we're not supposed to. We've sinned. We've done something really bad. How do we go on? How do we get back to where we were before? I was thinking about this recently with this kind of idea of cancel culture. If you've seen in the media and um, these days, if one of the politicians or somebody messes up and um, they do something wrong, something's found out about them and they get cancelled or sometimes they, they've dug up something they've said years ago and bring it back and they're shamed and they're publicly shamed and they're not able to they either have to resign or they're not able to um, participate in public life anymore. Maybe it's a celebrity that's messed up. And even before we get to think we're better than other people, quite often it's evangelical Christians. And there's plenty of these evangelical leaders, people that were well-known, and there's been a scandal. There's been something uncovered, something has happened. They've did something, they've been caught out. and Everything is ruined, all their legacy, all their ministry, everything they were involved in is, is gone. Um, and people are hurt, people are left behind, and there's, there's, uh, there's, it's right that there's judgment and justice. How do we move on from that? What happens if we've made a mistake? Um, can we find forgiveness? Can we move on from there? Um, how can we fix things? We're going to read Psalm 51. If we turn to, to Psalm 51, it was a very well-known psalm. The little introduction that we've got there um, tells us it's for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So this is David has sinned, and um, we'll think that David has messed up. Where do we go from there? How do we move on from there? We're going to read together Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole, and then bulls will be offered on your altar. And God will bless his word to us as we come to, to think of this psalm, um, this well-known psalm, a psalm of lament, uh, a psalm of brokenness before God and repentance. And we'll think about this question, when we've sinned before God, when we've done something we know is wrong and we realize it or we're exposed with it, how do we move on from there? How do we find forgiveness from God? Just to set the context, as we, we you'll know some of the story, when David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, David had blown it. And David was the king. David is, we, is the, called the man after God's own heart, the, the righteous king. All the other kings that come after him are compared to David, where they write like David. God's chosen king, the one that he'd chosen to bless, and that through his descendants, the whole world would be blessed. 
And yet, when you read Samuel and you read Second Samuel and you read the things David does, you kind of think, how can this be right? How can this be the man after God's own heart? And this one act, more than, more than anything else he did, this one act with Bathsheba destroyed him. It destroyed his legacy. It, it splits his reign in two. There are consequences that come after this. But everything that he, God had done through him, all the promises God had made, everything that God had, had done for him, taking him from obscurity and making him the king of the land, giving him victory over his enemies, and he throws it all away because um, he sees this woman uh, and he goes for her. Now, obviously, we, we, when we think of scandals like this and we, we hear about David, we think of these big scandals, don't we? These big Christian leaders that we knew, that we followed, that we listened to their stuff, we heard from their teaching, and yet it's all ruined because something's happened. They've done something. It's a reminder of how weak and how sinful we actually are. But it, it didn't just come out of the blue. David was, it was a, a man after God's own heart. He followed God, but he wasn't perfect. And we read through David, we see that David had six wives, not just the one, six wives. So David was compromised. Every time David went to make offerings at the tabernacle, he would have to walk by six bedrooms to get there. Uh, and David it regularly lived with that, and there was compromise. Uh, and there was things he knew weren't right, the little things that he tolerated and just compromised with. And then um, it led to worse, didn't it? It led to, to going in adultery and then covering it up as well. Eventually, the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, um, who wouldn't do what David wanted him to do. So he had to be killed. Uh, and David had him killed and uh, put away with. And he thought he got away with it, didn't he? Uh, until Nathan, the prophet, went to expose him. God saw what David had did. Um, and God sees, and God sees when we sin, God sees when we, we do things that he's not pleased with, do things that hurt him, and he's, he's not pleased with David, uh, and he sends Nathan to expose it. If David was today, this would be a big scandal, wouldn't it? A political scandal. Think of the Me Too movement. David would be cancelled. David would be facing jail time, and in, in, in the law of Israel, David should be put to death. What David has done is evil uh, and wicked, uh, and this is a big scandal. And as we said, we're no better than David. And we think of our lives today, and I'm sure if we're honest with ourselves, and I'm sure you'll know yourself, we do things that are wrong, don't we? We do things that we're not proud of. If, if my sins, the, th the secrets that I kept were exposed like this and, and put on the projector for you to see, I wouldn't be here. I'd be running away. I wouldn't want you to see the things that I've done in my life. We're no better th than King David. Uh, and we see that with these evangelical leaders, people that were given power and responsibility and, and had a, a, a position, a platform, and they mess it up uh, and they, they do these, these big sins. What happens when, when Christians sin? You know, when I was a teenager, I struggled to tell my testimony. Um, and, you know, you kind of think, well, my testimony is quite boring. I was brought up in a Christian home and, and nothing much was different. But one of the things I struggled with to articulate was that I committed more sin as a Christian than before I was a Christian. I was saved at seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not exactly sure how old I was, but I hadn't done much when I was seven years old. Um, and yet I knew Jesus loved me. I knew Jesus died for me and I put my trust in him. And then as a teenager, I, I committed sin and I did things that were wrong, did things that I'm not proud of. What do we do when we sin when we're Christians? And um, we've got no excuses. Um, and we can't go back. We know what God's word says. We know the Ten Commandments. We know what God expects of us. David knew the law. He knew what God was asking from him. And he knew all the things that God had given him. There's, there's something about sin that's so self-destructive, isn't it? And um, when we turn away from things, when we ruin everything and everything's broken. I wonder if you've been there before. I wonder if you've been in a scenario where you're exposed with what you've done, something you've forgotten about, something you, you've, you've lied to others, you've lied to yourself, and yet it comes to the front, and how do you deal with it? And how do you pray? But you ever had that time where you, you come to God and you, you, you don't know what to say, and, and you say sorry, and it sounds so hollow, doesn't it? Um, we don't have the words to say. There's nothing we can bring, nothing we can do. That's where David is at the start of this psalm, as he pens these words, David is at his lowest, it's hopeless, there's nothing he can do, there's nothing he can say, he's wrong, and he knows he's wrong, and he's guilty before God, and then we come to the, the first few verses of the psalm, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, David needs God's mercy, 
he comes to God. It's the, the only place to go. There's there's nowhere else we can go. It's like a child when you when a child's young, like one or two, three years old, and you give them into trouble and they get upset and they cry. They then run back to their parents, don't they? They have to run back to their mum or their dad and, and hug them because they've got nowhere else to go. There's nobody else. That, there's no other place we can find forgiveness, no other place we can find salvation. When we've sinned, and we'll see this in the psalm, it's before God that we've sinned. It's his law we've broken. We need to go back to him. Uh, and there's nothing we can bring. There's nothing impressive we can do. We can't atone for it ourselves. We can't do something amazing to, to get God to forget the thing that's wrong. We need to cry out to him for mercy. And this is the psalm of a broken man who needs God's love. This is the right place to start, the right place to go. It is to come back to God. Have mercy on me, O oh God. And we're not trusting ourselves, trusting our own action. It's trusting God's character, trusting his unfailing love and his great compassion. It, just with, with Hebrew poetry, just to, to, to get you into the, the mood of the Psalms, um, you quite get this, Hebrew poetry doesn't have rhymes. In our poetry, we have rhyming words. They didn't really do that in Hebrew, and, and it's quite good because it's been translated into all the different languages, so rhymes wouldn't work if it was translated into English. You would miss it. Um, but how does Hebrew poetry work? You get these parallelisms. So you get the same line, it will say something, and then sometimes the second line will say the same thing again, or something slightly different. It gives us the idea in two, two halves. So you say there, um, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Two lines that help us understand it's God's mercy that we need. And then you get um, two lines again, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. It helps us understand what David is looking for. He wants his, just that, that feeling of the, the wrong that we've done, the sin that's sitting there. We want God just to take it away. We need God to remove it. We can't deal with it ourselves. And David comes before God and is honest before him. He needs God to deal with his sin and to deal with the wrong in his life. Verses um, three to six, we're, we're going to think about sin, the reality of sin. What is sin? Uh, and what does it mean that we say we're sinners, we've broken God's law, and when we sin, what is it about? David thinks about his sin. He's honest before God. There's nothing to hide here. There's no point in lying to God. We can lie to others. We can cover things up. Uh, and David had did that initially with, with Bathsheba. He tried to lie about it. We can even lie to ourselves. And there's that little verse when, when David goes to sends Jacob to uh, Joab to, to kill Uriah, uh, uh, Joab sends the word back and David's not really bothered about it. He's lied to himself. He's almost forgotten the thing that he's done. He's made it um, okay for himself. He's justified himself. And we're good at doing that, aren't we? We're good at um, lying to ourselves. We can't lie to God. God sees. And that's in the, the, the chapter in Samuel, it says God did not please the Lord what David had done. And he sends in Nathan the prophet. Now David can't hide anything. And he's honest before God. And in these verses, he talks about his own sin and what it means that he's a sinner. That's where we need to start. We need to agree with God that we are sinful. We can't pretend anything. Um, David says, verse three, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And he agrees God is right in his verdict and justified when we judge. John says in the New Testament, if we claim we are without sin, there were liars and the truth is not in us. And, and we, we're, we're Christians, we're following Jesus, we're trusting in Jesus for forgiven. He's dealt with our sin in the past, but we still sin from time to time, don't we? There's still mistakes that we make. Uh, we're not in the glory yet where God is still working in us. He's still transforming our bodies uh, and we occasionally sin uh, and we fall into patterns of sin uh, again and again. And, and John says, if we claim we're without sin, then we lie. Uh, and the truth is, it is, we need to be honest before God. And David is honest before God. Tim Keller puts it this way, which I quite like. He says that there's two types of people in the world. Um, so we all are sinners. And really, if we're honest with ourselves, every human being, we know what we're sinners. We've got a conscience. We know what right and wrong is. We know we've broken God's law. But there's two types of people. There's people that know they've sinned uh, and they try and fix it themselves and they try and sort it themselves. And that's, that's religion, isn't it? It's trying to do the right thing, trying to atone for what you've done and trying to sort things out. And then there's others that say, you know what, I've messed up, I've sinned, I can't do anything about this. And we turn to God and we turn to God in repentance. We need God to save us and God to rescue us. 
It's the parable the Lord Jesus tells, isn't it? The Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee brought all the things that he'd done. And, and we read the story and we think the Pharisee's the baddie and that's in our, our thinking. But really, the, the, the Pharisee was the hero in, in their culture. The Pharisee was the one that was close to God, that knew God's law. And he's done all these good things. He prays all the time. He, he gives to the poor all the things you would want to do. The Pharisee's got them all lined up so that he can get justified before God. But he's not justified before God because we can't sort our sin out ourselves. And if we come to God thinking, I can fix this, I can sort this, that won't work. We need to come like the tax collector and like David here who, who beats his breast and says, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's nothing David can do. He needs God's salvation. He needs God's mercy and God's forgiveness. We need to acknowledge our sin before God. What what do you mean by sin? So what does the, the Bible, just to define sin here, and obviously we're in the psalm and we're, we're thinking of the Hebrew here, uh, but John, I find John Stock quite helpful. He says in the New Testament, there's five different Greek words for sin. Uh, and that helps us get the idea. It's, it's not just that there's this evil before God, this thing that we're, we're, we have, but there's different ways of looking at it. One of the words is quite common, the, the words harmatia, which is to, to fall away. So you think of missing the target. Um, all have sinned and fall short of glory of God. We're, we're aiming for, for perfection, but we don't quite hit it. And we don't quite hit the target. We miss the mark. And that's one of the pictures that even if it's a little sin, even if it's a great big sin, it still misses what God is expecting of us. But there's these other two words, and they're to do more with the trespass. And you get that there with, uh, David talks about transgressions, and he talks about trespasses later on. This idea of breaking the law, of, of being defiant before God. Um, and it's, it's kind of like if there's a sign saying, keep off the grass, as we look about, and then we deliberately walk in the grass. And it's not an accident. It's not like, oops, I, I don't realize what it was. It's shaking your fist at God uh, and putting our sets, being rebels uh, and rebelling before God. There's a bit of us that, that wants to have our own way and wants to put ourselves first. Uh, and that's one of the sides of sin. And then the other two words, they're more about the inside and in our hearts and they're corrupt and they're, they're something ugly, something that's broken, that's twisted, that's not right before God. Um, in Isaiah 59, Isaiah has one of the, the um, bleakest descriptions of the human condition. And he says that in our hearts, there's these um, snakes, eggs and spiders come out of them. Um, and there's something in us that's corrupt, that is ugly, that is offensive to God, that is sin inside. And, and David sees that here, doesn't he? He, sends, he sinned against God. He says he was sinful at birth, sinful from the time his mother conceived him. And there's something in David that is broken, something in David that, that misses the mark. We're, we're evil uh, and we're turned away from God. Paul would talk about the flesh, the old way of life, that the flesh, that the sinful bit of us that still fights against our, our spiritual selves, the sinful self that still fights. Uh, and David is wrestling with that here. There's a, a great description of, of human beings here in verse five and six. Verse five says, we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. And yet verse six, yet God desires faithfulness even in the womb and taught me wisdom in that secret place. And there's a kind of dichotomy here where we're made in the image of God and God has given us a conscience. He's given us an understanding of him, a knowledge of him. And, and people are valuable. People are worthwhile because they're made in God's image. And yet there's sin. We're marred with sin. And even when we're conceived in the womb, even before we were born, we're, we've got this image of God and yet it's messed up with sin. Uh, and those are the two parts of, of human beings. Alistair Begg it puts it this way. He's got a picture of, he talks about the old castles. If you go about Scotland, you see all these old ruins, these old castles. Uh, and they've collapsed now hundreds of years ago and you can climb up the ruins and things. That's a picture there because you can tell the castle used to be beautiful. And you can see it used to have windows and you can imagine what shape it used to be. And yet it's broken. And there's something of its majesty still there. There's something you see and you say, oh, that is beautiful. And we look at human beings. We see uh, men and women and boys and girls. There's something beautiful and valuable. But God made us and God delights to make us. And yet it's somehow broken. It's not what it used to be. And that's the image here. There's, we were, we've got God desires faithfulness and truth. And he's taught us, he's given us a conscience and made us in his image. And yet we're sinful at birth and we're evil from the time we were conceived. Something is broken. 
This is a really controversial idea, by the way. Um, the idea of original sin, that all of us are born sinful. If you go online, um, I was having a look through Twitter and some of the um, conversations about this, and a lot of people that have left Christianity and complain about all the things that the church teach, it's really controversial to say people are sinners and say people are born sinful. Uh, and people don't like the idea that, that young children and, and we and human beings are born evil. And yet I think it's one of the most obvious things that the Bible teaches. I think it's one of the clearest things that, that, that the Bible says. I was watching one of these um, BBC um, murder mysteries. And in the, the show, the, the lady, her um, she's raising this wee boy and her, his dad's a serial killer. His dad's a really bad, evil person. And part of the show is she's struggling with her when her, the, the, the boy fights with people at school uh, and she's worried about raising him. She's worried he's going to turn out like his dad. Uh, but in the show, it's quite interesting. She's got this view of good people and bad people. And she wrestles with this. Is her son going to be a good person or a bad person? Is he going to be like his dad? Um, or is he going to be a good person? And she kind of divides the world up like that. And she can't cope with it when, when he does bad things. Uh, and that's the problem. When we, we, we try and think there's good and bad people and we're born okay and people just turn bad, then we sort of divide the world into good and bad people. And the problem with that is we then get to take ourselves out of the bad people and we think we are good. And we think we're okay and everybody's got our own standards. We can't judge the world like that. Actually, the, ironically, the idea of original sin is the only fair way to look at the world because that's the way the world really is. All of us were made by God. We're all valuable. We, we matter to God. And yet we're all sinners and we're all evil. Uh, and we need to be honest before God. So David understands his sin. He's not hiding it. Uh, and that's the first place to start, to come to God and to say we're sinful, we're broken, uh, and we need God's mercy. But there's good news. And this is when we come into verse 7 down to verse 12. There's good news. There is forgiveness and there is mercy. And God wants to save us uh, and transform us. If we turn to God, we can be cleansed uh, and we can be saved. David says in verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. That's when we, we first came to trust the gospel, isn't it? We were thinking in the family service about repentance, turning away from our sin and turning to God. There is forgiveness. And David's sin isn't held against him. God forgives David of his sin. It's scandalous, really. I mean, God, there's no reason God should do this. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve God's anger. And yet God is willing to forgive us. He's willing to not hold our sins against us. How on earth is this possible? Well, Paul talks about this in the New Testament, does he? Paul, in, in Romans 7, he's struggling with his own sin and, you know, the good things he, he wants to do, he doesn't do, and the bad things he doesn't want to do, he keeps on doing those things. He says, who shall rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, because we've got a saviour, Jesus. He says in Romans 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's good news. We can be forgiven. God will not hold our sin against us. We can be justified before God. Uh, and God can cleanse us of our sin. And even as Christians, you know, we, we've um, we've been forgiven. We're, we're following God, but we still make mistakes. We said that at the start. We still sin from time to time. The Lord Jesus was honest with that with the disciples. He says that the one that's had a bath doesn't need to have a bath again, but they might need to clean their feet uh, and they might need to keep on being cleansed. Jesus will keep on cleansing us if we turn to him in faith. Um, again, the, the mercy of God, there's an exchange at the cross and Jesus took the, the blame and the punishment for all the wrong we have done. And we get the righteousness that belongs to the Lord Jesus. And God declares us to be righteous. And even when we mess up, we, we don't just have repentance when we get saved and then we kind of try it out on our own and God will see how well we do. That's not how the gospel works. Um, we continually repent. We continually turn back to God and God begins to change us and transform us. There's nothing we can bring to God. David talks later on about sacrifice. He says, if, if, if you delighted in sacrifice, well, I would bring it. I would do all the things. I would, I would be there. But there's no sacrifice to this. David deserves to die. He needs mercy from God. And yet God is willing to forgive his sin. This is scandalous, isn't it? This is, this is amazing grace. God forgives us and he keeps on cleansing us and keeps on purifying us. We can keep close to God and keep having short accounts of God, keep bringing our sins to him.
God says, uh, John says in, in the New Testament, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. We can be forgiven, we can be clean and washed before God. Stephen Grant was, was preaching a few years ago and one of the phrases he took, which I've always kind of remembered, I don't know if he even remembers it, but I remember him saying this when he was preaching. He said, when God's grace is in effect, failure is never final. When we mess up, when God's grace is in effect, failure is never final. There's always a chance of redemption and a chance of grace. God loves to forgive us and he wants us to come from him. And David comes to God knowing of God's great compassion, knowing of his unfailing love and looking for forgiveness and looking for cleansing. Of course, it is true repentance. It's not, David isn't um, going to continue on in his sin. It says in verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit. Rejoy to me, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. We don't want to continue in our sin. We don't want to go back. When we've made a mistake and we're honest before God and we know we've made a mistake, there needs to be true re repentance. There needs to be a turning away from sin and asking God to help us. We can't do it on our own. We need God to give us a pure heart, to, to change us from the inside out, but we don't continue in our sin. Again, Paul in Romans, in, in Romans 6 verse 1 says, shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. By no means, Paul says. And that's the, the first time in Romans you get a command. Paul says, reckon yourselves dead to sin. Um, realize that you're dead to your old way of life. Stop doing it. Put it to death and, and move on. Walking in the Spirit, we need God's presence. And again, Paul in, in Romans chapter 8 comes to the Holy Spirit in our lives that gives us life, that brings us to life and allows us to stop sinning. We need to keep close to God. Um, David says, Create me a pure heart, O oh God. Um, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. We need the presence of God in our lives. We need to be reading God's word all the time and praying to him and asking him for help. That's the way we'll stop sin in our lives. Again, in, in Romans 8, 13, um, Paul says, if we um, continue in sin, if we sin in the body, we'll die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body, we will live. We need to put to death the sin in our life to stop doing it. And that's quite graphic. It's to kill it, to kill the old way of life, to crucify it, put it to death, stop doing these things. The Lord Jesus was um, very graphic about this as well. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Be clinical about it, surgical. If these things in my life are going to lead me into sin, I need to stop doing them. And that's the thing about repentance and forgiveness. It's absolutely true that we are forgiven and God doesn't hold our sin against us and we are free from our sin and, and we look forward to, to forgiveness and healing from God. There may still be consequences in this life. And David, although he was forgiven, and, and Nathan says to David, your sins are account, atoned for, you're forgiven. You don't need to worry about your sin anymore. There were consequences in David's life to the things that he'd done. Four of David's children died as a result of this sin. And David's legacy was ruined and, and he had Joab there. He couldn't get rid of Joab and all the things Joab was doing because of the, 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 the lack of moral authority because he, he, he committed this sin. There are consequences to the things. We hurt relationships. We, there's things happen to us in our lives, but we can have real forgiveness from God. And David was forgiven. David should be dead. He should be put to death, but he's forgiven because of God's mercy and God's unfailing compassion when we think about fighting our sin and, and putting to death our sin and doing the right thing, the encouragement is God wants us to win in this fight. God has chosen us. He saved us. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to come and cry out for mercy and he wants us to win. Jesus promised us life and life in all of its fullness. And that's available to us if we stay close to God and we repent as, as a life of continual repentance. As I've got older as a Christian, I've realized that, you know, one of the aspects of the Christian walk is you realize how bad you really are. Uh, and some of the sins that you didn't realize you were committing as you're older, you realize, man, I've, I've not been living right for a long time. And we need to put these things right before God. There's times where I've repented and I know in my heart and my head, I might do the same thing later on. And that's not right before God either. It needs to be true repentance. But God is changing us and transforming us. If we stay close to him, if we have his presence with us, there will be forgiveness and newness of life.
And then lastly, in verse 13 to, to 19, what does that mean for us? How, where do we go from here? So we've, we've, got, we've come to God. We've got God's mercy and God's forgiveness. We've repented of our sin, being honest before God. We can be forgiven. There's useful service now. God has a purpose for us. If we get rid of our sin, we can be used by God in our life. David says in verse 13 that he'll teach transgressors God's ways so that sinners will turn back to him. He says in, uh, in verse 15, open his lips and he'll praise God and, and, and praise. He'll open his mouth and praise. And, and then in, in verse 18, he talks about prospering Zion, building the walls of Jerusalem and del God delighting in sacrifices of the righteous. There would be sacrifices made. <laughs> we can serve God. God has saved us for a purpose. He's got a calling in our lives. He's not just saved us just because he, he wants to forgive us from our sin and he loves to save us. That's true. But he saved us with a purpose. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And for David, it was to teach sinners repentance, to teach others, to sing praises to God and to bring offerings in our life, bring offerings to God and worship to God. David had things to do after this. He, he still had a kingdom to look after. He had succession. He had to think about Solomon taking over. He had to think about the temple. There was things for David to do even after he'd sinned because God's forgiven him. He's dealt with his sin and he's got a purpose and a plan for David. And that's true for us today, this afternoon. God's forgiven us from our sin. He's washed us clean uh, and we continually come in repentance. God has a plan for us. Uh, and a purpose for us. And it's up to us. It's exciting for us to go and find out what that is, find out what God has in store for us. Um, Oz Guinness in his book, The, the Call, he um, splits the, the call of God in our lives into two parts. So he talks about the primary call and the secondary call. The primary call, the important call of God, and then the secondary call, the one that comes after that. Um, the primary call is the same for all Christians. We're called to follow Jesus. We're called to put him first in our life, to love God, to love others. We're called to make disciples. All of us are to be involved in making disciples, being ambassadors for Christ. God has a purpose for us, and it's the same purpose for all of us as, as the people of God, to serve him and to put him first. But then the secondary call, God has a specific call for your life as well. He's given you gifts. He's given you things that you're good at, spiritual gifts that he's, he's calling you to use for his glory. And that will be different for every one of us. Maybe you're good at chatting to people one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you, you've got a gift in teaching God's word. Maybe you're good at um, practical things and organizing things. You, you know the gifts that, that Paul talks about, administration and teaching and prophesying and helping and caring and loving, all these things. God has given you gifts, things that you're good at that's given to you, and he's calling you to use them for his glory. God has a call on our lives. But we... If we want to be useful to God, if we want to serve God, we need to deal with our sin first. I mean, to repent of our sin, continue to repent of our sin and be clean. God can't use sacrifices that are, are um, coming from a sinful place. David says in verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifices or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. If there's things in our life that aren't right, compromises we've made, things that we know consciously aren't right and we continue in our sin, then we're not useful to God. And we'll waste our lives, we'll waste our time, waste every, all the gifts that God has given us will just be wasted. And we can look back in our lives and see the time that's wasted. Don't be like that. Bring your sin before God, get forgiveness and grace and, and, and a new purpose, and a new calling from God. God will do it for you and he'll give you a purpose to work for him. It's exciting, there's an there's a eternal purpose, it's, Things of God that will last forever. For David, he's um, to prosper Zion, to build the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, and then you're th he's thinking about the temple and bringing sacrifices. David's uh, purpose was to um, make Israel peaceful, make Jerusalem the capital, build up and prosper Jerusalem, govern the people, and then make way for the temple uh, and for Solomon to come uh, and build the temple. What's God's purpose is for us? We are not building a physical city, but we have an eternal city that we're looking forward to. We have a new creation that we will be a part of a kingdom that is coming. God has a work for us that will last forever. It's building the, the, the people of God, building the kingdom of God. It's, it's about people, building up people's lives, looking after people, making disciples, seeing people won for the kingdom and seeing people come to know God. The idea of salvation, um, we get that word salvation, it's like the word salvage. 
they've got a car. My car last week failed its MOT and it's, it's useless. I need to get the horn fixed and the guy's coming out this week to look at the electronics and try and fix the horn. And until he does that, I, I, it's no use to me. I can't take it anywhere. But once that horn's fixed, once it's salvaged and it's it's the car is salvaged, it's fixed, I can drive it again. And then it's, it's useful to me. And it's like that with us. If we get sin in our lives that we've not confessed to God, sin that we're ignoring, we need to get it dealt with. But once we've got it dealt with and we know God's salvation and the joy of the salvation, we can be useful to God. God has a purpose and a plan for us and for each one of our lives. And God calls us to follow him. But if we waste our lives and, and waste our lives in sin, we can miss that purpose for God. And you read through the, the kings uh, and you see some kings that were good. You see some kings that were bad. You see some kings that were good at the start and then fell away toward the end. And they wasted what God ha had given them. I wonder how many in heaven will, will look back and, and see their lives wasted. They're saved because of God's grace, but they haven't done much for God. Or will we look back and we'll see actually no... God was able to do things in my life because I was ready. I was willing. As David says, a, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. He has a purpose and a plan for you if you would just come to him and come in faith and repentance. So there is good news. There is forgiveness. When we blow it, when we make mistakes, when we do things that are wrong and we think, how do we ever get past this? We need forgiveness from others. We need forgiveness from God. If we come to God honestly, confess our sins before him, repent, turn away from our sin, there is real forgiveness. God will not hold our sins against us. They're taken away from us. Uh, and God will renew a, a new heart, a pure heart within us uh, and give us his Holy Spirit. But we need to come in real repentance and we need to um, bring our sins before God and turn away from them uh, and turn back to God. And if we do that, God has a purpose for us, a plan for us. And he has use for us after that. So there's good news in the, the psalm, even in a, a psalm of lament where David's in his lowest place, there is good news because of God's unfailing love, because of his great compassion. God is a God who loves to save and continue to save us and change us and use us for his kingdom and for his glory. Let's just turn to God in prayer. Father, we just give thanks for your great mercy. 